Son, you're getting older now, and your mother and I would like to talk to you about some very important things. First of all, we love you, and we only want the very best for you. Now, you're heading to college soon, and you're going to be out there making your own choices and being independent. You have your entire life ahead of you. Getting an education, finding a career, falling in love, and having a family of your own. All these are worthy pursuits. And they're going to give you lots of joy and fulfillment. But honestly, life is so much more than pursuing these things. It has to be for something bigger. Your mother and I, we don't care if you're rich. We don't care if you're successful. All we want, all we hope for as your parent, is for you to know God and let him lead you in your life. He has some amazing plans for you, son. All you have to do is trust him and you'll see. Does this make any sense at all? Do you understand where we're coming from? Okay, Daddy. Good job, Daddy. I think that was a good first run. What do you say? Same time next week? Camp meeting 2013, we've spent wandering around the home. We started in the kitchen, the heart of the home, where we talked about commitment as the heart of the emotional relational home. From there we went, I admit, not eagerly, but we went to the garage, where we talked about cleaning out the stuff of our lives, the stuff that keeps us from living an abundant life. And from there to the front porch. On the front porch, we talked about community the community that maybe we had and don't have, and we even suggested that we as a church want a large front porch. And then last week, we climbed the crickety stairs up to the attic, and we looked at the treasures or the skeletons there, and we talked about being transitional people. This week, our last week, we come to the bedroom, but more specifically to the hope chest, at the head of the bed. At the hope chest, we talk about something different. Now, I want to make sure that you even know what a hope chest is. My guess is there are some of you here who don't know what a hope chest is, so let me just tell you that a hope chest is usually a cedar chest where a mother typically puts valuable items for her daughter's one-day wedding and home. She might put tablecloths in there, or she might put special letters. She might even put certain pictures, other things of value that represent her hopes and her desires for that young woman. Sometimes the items don't ever make it to the hope chest. They're too big or there wasn't time my mother was born into a family of three sisters, three sisters whose last name was brothers. So they were the brothers' sisters, or the sisters that were brothers or something like that. <laughs> well, the mother to the brothers' sisters was a woman named Mimi. Mimi was my grandmother. Mimi was killed in an automobile accident some years before I was born. But by the time I came onto the scene, my grandfather, we called him Daddy Phil. Daddy Phil had remarried, and he had remarried a woman named Ruby. I don't remember much about Ruby. My memories of her are kind of foggy. But I do remember a couple of things. I remember that Ruby was not at all happy 
about giving things to the brothers' sisters. Not at all. In fact, my grandfather, Daddy Phil, was a rather well-to-do building contractor in Fort Worth, Texas. Had done well in his occupation. And so he had some of the things of this world that could be passed on, and Ruby was intent that they not be passed on. I can remember, for example, it's, it's one of those photographs, one of those memories of my early years. We had come back on furlough from the mission field and were there in Fort Worth, Texas, and on that particular day had gone over to Daddy Phil's house where in conversation with my parents, he said, you know, not long ago, I bought one of these new Super 8 movie cameras. I want to give that to you. I want you to take that back with you to South America, and I want you to record. I want to see what it's like where you are. Well, my memory is this. Ruby stomping around the house, opening, slamming closet doors because she didn't want to find, and she certainly did not want to give away that movie camera. But she finally found it and gave it to us. While we were in South America, when Daddy Phil became very ill, she had an attorney come with her to the hospital where he signed certain papers, which meant that my mother and her sisters or his grandchildren never saw any of what he had intended for them. Included in that were those mementos, those very special kinds of things that every mother wants to place in a hope chest. In fact, even after fighting it for some time, it turned out that they got very little of those items, and most of them were either given away or sold in garage sales. Great sentimental value. But there was one item, one thing that mom still has, it's a crystal punch bowl set. Not entirely sure how it made its way to her, except that ultimately it came through her next sister, next in line. But today, that crystal punch bowl has pride of place in mom and dad's dining room. And when special occasions roll around, it's Christmas, it's Thanksgiving, it's a special birthday of a family member, we drink punch from that crystal bowl. Those are the things. Those are the kinds of things that go into a hope chest. The things that we yearn to pass on. The hope chest represents our hopes for our children, for our family, our hopes for their future. I want to read to you two passages of Scripture this morning, passages that could very well be nestled into a hope chest because they speak of hope and future. The first one is in the Old Testament. It's found in Isaiah chapter 49. I want to give you the context before reading these verses because it will give them much better meaning. It is during that time that the land of Israel has been destroyed. The Assyrians have marched in and, and laid waste to their cities, raised the walls. They have decimated the army. They have destroyed families. They have ravaged the women, killed the fathers, taken the children as captive. There is a cacophonous chaos that echoes through the land of Israel. But right in the midst of that, right in the midst of the Assyrians' boot prints leading away just before Nebuchadnezzar's will return and destroy the temple, right during that period of time, a prophet named Isaiah writes, and he writes words of hope, of comfort for the future, words that could be well placed in a hope chest. It's about 11 or 12 verses long, but I want to read it with you this morning, Isaiah chapter 49. We'll start in verse 14. Verse 14 describes the feeling of the people who have experienced this devastation. But immediately in verse 15, God responds to that feeling. I begin in verse 14. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Now with 15, we begin God speaking. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. 
See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Your children hasten back, and those who laid you waste depart from you. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord. You will wear them all as ornaments. You will put them on like a bride. Though you were ruined and made desolate and your land laid waste, now you will be too small for your people and those who devoured you will be far away. The children born during your bereavement will yet say in your hearing, this place is too small for us. Give us more space to live in. Then you will say in your heart, who bore me these? I was bereaved and barren. I was exiled and rejected. Who brought these up? I was left all alone. But these, where have they come from? This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I will beckon the nations. I will lift up my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their hips. Kings will be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. They will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. They will lick the dust at your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord and that those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Can plunder be taken from warriors or captives be rescued from the fierce? But this is what the Lord says. Yes, captives will be taken from warriors and plunder retrieved from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you and your children. I will save. You see the picture? It's the picture of God saying, all of this destruction will have an end. The land will once again bear fruit. The cities will once again thrive. The army of Israel will once again march. And in the midst of it all, families decimated, destroyed, separated will be reunited. That's a passage. That's a promise for the hope chest. But I read you one more. This one much more brief. This one from the New Testament. Once again, the setting. It is the night before the crucifixion. Jesus is huddled in the upper room with his disciples. They know that something evil this way comes. They know that there's something different about Jesus on this night. There is cause for fear in the air. In the midst of all of the gathering storm, Jesus then speaks these future-oriented, hope-filled words. John 14, beginning with verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has plenty of room. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Some versions say, My Father's house has many rooms. That's another promise for the hope chest. So what does that mean to us? To us who have been considering home, to us who recognize that for some, home is warm and nurturing, and for others, home is threatening and violent and tragic. What does that mean to us? What does that mean to those of us who have been separated from our loved ones, either by distance or by divorce or by death? What does that mean? Well, I'd like to ask you to imagine with me today. I don't know that I do this very often. I usually just stick with the specifics of what the Word says, especially when it comes to a haven called heaven. But I want to ask you today to just imagine. Time has reached its culmination. Jesus has come. He has gathered his children to himself. And you find yourself, we find ourselves in his presence, in the kingdom of God. 
The moment comes when there you are. You suddenly find yourself face to face with Jesus. You have no words at first. You're trying to put together some semblance of a sentence that will depict the profound feeling of your heart. But finally, all you can say is, Jesus, for, for, for all of this, thank you. And he looks at you and smiles and says, well, child, you're welcome, my privilege. And you say to him, privilege? I mean, talk about privilege. That's me, not, not you. And he says to you, do you have children? And you say, well, well yes. He says, how many? You say three. He says, I knew that. <laughs> Tell me. Picture a day when you have done something very special for your children. Something that maybe cost you a lot, but that you were very eager to do for them. And then picture this as a day when contrary to what sometimes happens in our younger years, your children actually feel profound gratitude. And they say to you, oh, thank you so much. And Jesus looks at you and says, what do you say to them? And you say, well, I say, you're welcome. My privilege. And he says, that's right. That's why this is my privilege for you. This is why you're here. You think of how you have no words to describe the emotions churning in your soul when Jesus turns you around and faces you in another direction, puts his arm on your shoulder and says, let's walk. I'd like to show you the place. I'd like you to see this place I have prepared for you. And so you begin to walk through vistas that defy human imagination. And he describes them for you, tells you of the place, of its beauty, of its development, of its architecture. But as you walk, he says, I, I have something special for you. I have a surprise for you. Your heart beats a bit faster. But it's a long walk. You're in no rush. <laughs> You've got all kinds of time. And you walk and you notice the people. Everywhere you go, surrounded by people. People of different sizes, people of different ages, people of different colors. But they're all characterized by joy, just filled with this effervescent joy. You have to admit, you don't say this at first, but you have to admit that you are a bit surprised about some you see. You don't say anything until you walk past this one person, this one man. You know him, and you are stunned that he is here. You, 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 you can't help yourself. You finally say, Jesus, I, I have to ask you something. He looks at you and says, you look surprised, a bit shocked. You say, I am. Why is that? Well, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but that guy we just passed, how did he get in here? Jesus looks at you for one second and then bursts out laughing, laughing laughing uproariously. You're taken aback, and you say, what? What, what did I say? What was so funny? I, how did he get in here? Once he's able to get a little control and wipe away the tears from his eyes, he says, oh, that's the most I've laughed in a while. And you say, what is so funny? So you know that, that, that guy that you said, how did he get in here? <laughs> he said, yesterday he asked me the same thing about you. <laughs> <laughs> So I just thought that was very funny. And you say, what? He asked that about me? Well, that little, and you're about to say something. He says, wait, 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 remember where you are. <laughs> We're not in Texas, I mean Kansas anymore. And you say, oh, right, okay. Well, he, he asked that about me? He sure did, just the way you did. And exactly what did you say to him? <laughs> well, I said to him, 
Same thing I'm going to say to you. The way he got in, the way you got in, is the way everybody got in. I let you in. I opened the door and invited you home. And you say, wow, really? Thank you, Jesus. And he says, my privilege. But I still have something to show you. You see, here in the kingdom of God, he says, I have prepared a place for you. I have prepared you a room in the Father's house. That's where you'll live here in the city. One of these days, I'm going to take you out in the country, and I'm going to give you a place, a spread, where you can build your own country estate. But for now, for today, I want to show you the room I have prepared for you. So come. And you continue to walk. You finally arrive at the Father's house. <laughs> now, to call this a house is like calling Mount Everest a hill. This is immense. It is splendid. It is regal. It is breathtaking. You enter through the portals into the Father's house, into a lobby. You say, oh, my goodness. And he says, no, my goodness actually did this. And you say, oh, yes, that's right. That's right. Sorry about that. Wow, this is breathtaking. You say, well, this is just the lobby. We just want a little place for people to congregate. You say, wow. He says, I actually want to take you down one of the hallways. Now, he calls it a hallway. <laughs> you would call it a thoroughfare, a boulevard. It's immense in size. It is beautiful. The living greenery, the foliage, the plants, the fruits, the walkways. But as you begin down this walkway, you realize that there are doors periodically, apparently leading to rooms. And as you walk by, you can see names on doors. He says, come, come with me. I have something very special in mind for you. And you finally arrive at a door. He pulls you over and you stand looking at, that, at this immense entrance. And he says, now I want you to notice. And he, with his finger, underlines your name carved into the fine wood. And you say, Jesus, is this for me? He says, absolutely. This is your new home. And you say, can it actually be mine? He said, I prepared it with you in mind. Now you hold back just a bit, a bit uncertain yet as to what to do. You are overwhelmed at being in the presence of Jesus, stunned to be in the kingdom of God, grateful to see that you have a place. But... You know what makes a place home? It's the people. And Jesus looks at you and says, you're thinking about your kids, aren't you? And you say, yes. The first moment in the kingdom when you have felt a pang, yes, I'm thinking about them. I know they didn't really live as I had hoped they would, Jesus. But I had hoped that somehow, some way, and your voice trails off. And Jesus says, well, wait. There's something I want to show you. It's part of the surprise of the kingdom of God. Takes you by the hand and walks you across this, this, this boulevard to the other side where he shows you a door with a name thereon inscribed. That's the name of one of your children. And you say, Jesus, are they here? He said, well, I've prepared a place for them, one here, one down there, another well down the walk. You've prepared a place for them? I did. Are they here? Well, he says, let me tell you about that. 
And he walks you over to a chest, a chest that is near that child's door. You look at that chest. It is finely wrought, delicately engraved, sparkling with gems. You say, what is that, Jesus? He says, it's a hope chest. Do you know what a hope chest is? And you say, well, I, I think so. Isn't, isn't that that chest that mothers put stuff in for their daughter's wedding? He says, well, I, I don't know if you'd want to call it stuff in front of your mother, but, but yeah, that's essentially what it is. And you say, but, but my child is single. Ah, he says. But we still have a hope chest here for each of your children. And you say, Jesus, what is in the hope chest. He says, well, I'll tell you what's there. Over all the years, you talked with me. You prayed with me about those kids. And every time you prayed, we put that prayer in that child's hope chest. So this chest here is filled, filled. This one's pretty tight with all those prayers. And you say, Jesus, you, you heard those prayers? I, I didn't think you had heard. I could see no evidence in their lives. He said, I heard every prayer. You say, are you serious? He says, I'm as serious as cow. I am dead serious. Wow. But Jesus, I never saw anything in their life, anything that would indicate that you were working. He said, oh, make no mistake about it. There is no family. There is no human. There is no heart where I haven't been at work, where my spirit hasn't been there daily, pressing home their need for Jesus in their lives. And your prayers... We would have done it anyway, but your prayers brought a laser-like focus of intensity on that child. But Jesus, you said, it seemed to make no difference. And he says, <laughs> careful. There are some things parents don't know, but I do. There are some things that I've taken care of and didn't tell you. And maybe this is one of them. And so you say, well, Jesus, th those prayers then, did you answer them? Well, he says, we did everything that heaven could do to answer them. Absolutely. We spared no expense. In fact, he says, I would recommend that, 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 that you open this hope chest. And that you go through those prayers, you bring some of them with you because we're going to a big event. And it's a great event where you will be able to say something about answered prayers. And you say, answered? Does that mean you answered them? Well, he says, we'll see. But we have to go shortly. Where are we going? Well, he says, you asked about a hope chest. You said, isn't a hope chest a place where a mother places those things for a daughter's wedding? He says, let me tell you, the hope chest is where I have placed your prayers and my promises for the event we're attending. And you say, what is that? He says, you and I are going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that will be the place where you will get to share a bit about what the journey has been like for you, and I will get to share a bit about what it's been like to woo people to myself. And you say, but Jesus, are they here? He says, well... I guess you'll have to open that door and find out. You reach for the knob. 
By now, your hand is trembling. Your heart is palpitating. Jesus reaches out and lays a strong, firm, scarred, but gentle hand on your arm. And he says, now you must remember one thing. And you say, what is that? He says, well, I had a friend, <laughs> a very good friend. And I conversed much, and, and I, I inspired him to write something that you may want to remember as you open that door. And you ask, what, what was that? He said, well, a very good friend of mine once wrote these words. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the human heart the things that God has prepared for those that love him. So remember that. And you reach out your hand again. And with what appears to be somewhat trembling, waning strength, you grasp that handle. And you slowly begin to turn the handle. This is heaven. Just being in the presence of Jesus is heaven. But if there's someone in this room, it will feel much more like home. And he smiles and pats you on the shoulder and says, go ahead. Open the door. You grasp the knob and you open the door. As you do so, you hear down that hallway somebody is singing in the sweet by and by. You open that door and heaven begins. 